All right. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. Glory forever. <laughs> Hello. Welcome, everyone. We're delighted to have you here uh, this evening for uh, the first in our series. Um, this is a, a new type of Becoming Byzantine series. We did a series last year, and uh, this is uh, uh, one where we're actually uh, diving a little bit deeper, but also giving folks an opportunity to explore uh, the the lessons that were in the Becoming Byzantine series uh, just prior. And we're delighted that all of you are joining. We, we have some folks trickling in here, uh, which we appreciate. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And I'll, I'll just um, begin with a, with a prayer, if I might. So, <clears throat> in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, everywhere present, filling all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and dwell within us, cleanse of all stain and save our souls, O gracious one. Name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So again, welcome to all of those who are joining us uh, today. Uh, my name is Father Daniel Dozier, and I'm a Byzantine Catholic priest uh, of the Eparchy of Phoenix and the Assistant Director of Religious Education uh, for our Eparchy, which is based in Phoenix. I'm actually based in Olympia, Washington, uh, where I'm the pastor of uh, St. George Byzantine Catholic Church, as well as the administrator for St. Irene's Byzantine Catholic Church in Portland. And we also have an outreach that I helped to run in Castle Rock, Washington. And uh, I'm this episode is being uh, brought to you by a Vineyard of the Lord Catholic Ministries, uh, which is sponsored by the Byzantine at Catholic Eparchy of Phoenix, as well as uh, the Metropolitan Andre Shaptitsky Institute uh, in Canada. So we're delighted to have all of you here uh, today. This is hopefully embarking on an exciting journey. Uh, it's going to take us over the course of the year uh, through the catechism, uh, Christ our Pascha, the Ukrainian Greek Catholic catechism. If you don't have a copy of this yet, we're going to tell you how you can order this copy. Also download the online version of it, and uh, hopefully you'll have a chance to pick up a copy or at least begin to reading, read it if you haven't yet. Uh, the, the last year that I mentioned, we went through the entire catechism uh, there were a number of us involved, uh, for instance, uh, Mr. Robert Klesko from EWTN, Father Michael Wynn, who is the English language editor for the, can uh, for the um, catechism, um, uh, Father Joseph Matlack and his wife, Pani Katie Matlack, and Father Deacon Anthony Dragani, uh, also very actively involved. We had uh, 12 webinars and 36 lessons, so 48 uh, videos that uh, re recorded content on the catechism. And so uh, we're going to be using that or leveraging that for this particular series, which is being principally sponsored by the Upper Key of Phoenix. But I'm delighted to be joined by uh, my brother priest, uh, Father uh, James Bankston, and uh, who's based in San Diego in California. Father, uh, good evening, and thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm very happy to be included in this, and I look forward to the next year of uh, webinars. It's going to be it's going to be a great uh, great conversation. In fact, there are going to be other priests that are going to be joining us. Um, we uh, Father Michael O'Laughlin uh, will be a part of this, um, and some and some other priests and laity as well. And I hope it hope it ends up being a great conversation uh, over the course of the next year. Um, one of the things I do want to share with you, if you haven't already um, seen the link, let me just go over to my uh, show notes here. Uh, we do have a link that will take you to. Um, all of the content from the last year, uh, the work that we did. So uh, the first link I'm going to share, and I'm going to do this in the chat, is going to be the link to the YouTube channel uh, where you can access all of the videos for the, all the 40, um, 48 videos that I mentioned. And the next one is going to be our Apple podcast link. So if you don't want to watch the YouTube videos, but you're open, to, you want to you want a little bit more and and maybe take it on the road and you know maybe use it for your walks or your activities, you can use the Apple Podcasts of all that series. So again, we're delighted to be able to offer these for free, and um, because we're excited about our faith, want to share our faith, and uh, but we do welcome your support. Uh, if you are interested in helping to support us, and I'll post a link a little bit later on on ways that you might also help us um, with uh, with the work that we're doing. So again, the purpose of this series is to engage more in the lessons uh, of the Catechism, Christ or Pascha, 
<clears throat> and, uh, and, and it's really meant for those who are either Byzantine Catholic already, uh, maybe attending a Byzantine Catholic parish, uh, or have friends who are Byzantine, or just those that are just curious to learn a little bit more. Maybe they've, they've never set foot in a Byzantine Catholic parish, but they're really interested in diving deeper, want to find out more about Byzantine Catholic faith. This is, this is what we're about. This is one of the reasons why we're doing that. So, uh, Father, maybe we could start off. Would you be willing to share a little bit about yourself and, and your background, just so that people get to know you a little bit better? And, um, and I'll, I'll follow up with some comments as well about myself. And mm -hmm. uh, but it'd be great to well, hear. My, my name is Father James Bangston. I'm a married Catholic priest of the Byzantine Eparchy of Phoenix. I was ordained to the priesthood in 2004 for the Ukrainian Catholic Eparchy of Chicago. And I transferred over to the Byzantine Catholic Eparchy of Phoenix about three years ago. Um, I was born and raised in Colorado. And I was raised in the Roman tradition, but had a lot of encounters with the Eastern tradition through my mother's family who, from Slovakia. And there was a mix of uh, Eastern Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and Roman Catholic. So I had a, a fairly uh, diverse experience when I was growing up. Um, when I married in 92 to my wife, Olena, I took advantage of canon law to transfer canonically from the Roman tradition to the Ukrainian Catholic Church. I, I really felt like I came home at that point. Mm -hmm. When we discerned, and I say we discerned the call to the priesthood, um, I decided to go to Canada to study at Holy Spirit Seminary in Ottawa, Canada, and the theologic or the uh, academic formation for that seminary was done through the Metropolitan Andriy Sheptitsky Institute for Eastern Christian Studies, mm -hmm. founded by a dear friend of mine, Father Andriy Churovsky. And uh, I, we wanted to go there because that was the only real, at the time, only real um, Full, fully accredited uh, program from bachelor's to the PhD program for Eastern Christian Studies. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it was part of the Faculty of Theology of the University of Ottawa. And uh, so we were very glad that we made that jump from the United States to Canada at the time. And uh, just really were blessed with our ability to study with such people as Father Andriy Churovsky, Father Petro Galadza, Father Andriy Kravchuk, uh, I'm not sorry, not Father, uh, Andriy Kravchuk and Father Andrew Onoferko, mm -hmm. just very good uh, scholars and theologians that uh, I think uh, really enhanced my studies for the priesthood and, and made it, um, it was a great blessing for me. And I, I highly recommend the Shoptitsky Institute. Wonderful. Wonderful, Father. Yes, and and we're very grateful for the support of the uh, Metropolitan and Andrei Shubitsky Institute as well. Uh, Father Michael Wynn, who uh, was the English language editor that I mentioned earlier, I believe he also did his studies there. He was a uh, classmate of mine. We we were sat next to one another very often. So <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> yeah, and and it's uh so so it's a it's it's one of those institutes that I think over the years um, has has developed many prominent leaders. Uh, Cler clerical leaders, uh, so clergy, laity, uh, monastic, religious, um, that are having a, a real impact on not just the Eastern Catholic world, but the, but the world generally, and, and mm -hmm. they're teaching and, and spreading some of the wealth of the, of, the, of the Christian East generally. So we're grateful to have you uh, as part of our, our team here, Father, in, the, in this particular webcast, and, and looking forward to our conversations. Among the luminaries that you mentioned is Patriarch Sviatoslav Shevchuk. Ah. The father of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church, who studied at the Sheptitsky Institute. In fact, he did a summer institute up in um, Ukiah, up in uh, Redwood Valley, California. And I happen to be a classmate of his. So I can claim to be a classmate of the patriarch of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church. So That's wonderful. Yeah, yes. no, that's, that's terrific. And yeah, many of those summer courses at the monastery, I think yeah, people still continue to take advantage of, of that mm -hmm. time. Uh, to do that. That's wonderful. Well, and, and Father, it's interesting you mentioned your background. Um, I too was raised in the, uh, in the Latin tradition. And, um, and so for me, it was my first encounter was when I was attending Franciscan University of Steubenville as an undergrad and first encountered the Byzantine East 
and my reaction was, uh, it was a St. Thomas Sunday. So it's the Sunday after Pascha, for those that may not be familiar with our, our use of St. Thomas Sunday or when, when it occurs. And I remember uh, talking to my friends saying, you know, I've, I've always believed in the resurrection. I just don't think I've ever experienced it that way before. Uh, it was this amazing moment, um, and and it resonated with me spiritually, and I knew this is something I, I really have to be a, a, a part of at some point. And so over the years, I continued my studies and would attend services from time to time. And then uh, when my family and I moved to Minnesota, uh, did eventually join uh, a Ruthenian Byzantine Catholic Church. And then uh, later on, uh, after moving to the East Coast, um, I was uh, I was ordained uh, for the Ukrainians. So I also was in the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, uh, ordained my father's uh, Ukrainian Catholic deacon uh, as well. And so we got to serve together for many years. And then uh, when I moved to the West Coast, and, and at that point, I had transferred back to the Ruthenians and, and have been in the Ruthenian Byzantine Catholic Church Eparchy of Phoenix now for several years. I've been a priest just three years. I was a deacon for 12 years. I uh, have a priest for three years now, and it's just a delight to be able to to serve in this tradition and also to spread the wealth, to share a little bit more about, you know, why we believe what we believe and to introduce people, even if it's just to visit, you know, to have them perhaps experience our liturgy, experience our worship, and then go back to their Western traditions, and it helps to reframe uh, what they're experiencing in the liturgy. It's It's a new way of looking at um, at, for instance, the celebration of the Eucharist. So, so it's my it's my delight also to uh, to be here as well. So, thank you, Father. So, we've <clears throat> one of the things I want to mention before we dive into the lessons for today uh, is that um, is that we are going to have a resource, hopefully launched by uh, July. By the next time we meet in July, it's it's called becomingbyzantine.net, uh, and uh, this is going to be a way for uh, people to <laughs> to access the webinars, the resources in a learning format. We've also got some tools for catechists and then just for interested individuals uh, who want to dive a little deeper into the Christ or Pascha catechism as well as uh, into the Byzantine uh, into the Byzantine Catholic faith, uh, whatever the jurisdiction, whether it's Ukrainian, Ruthenian, Melkite, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know it's it's all sharing this wonderful heritage. Of, uh, of the Byzantine uh, Christian patrimony. Uh, so let's see, with that said, let's hear a little bit about who's here with us today. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch a poll, which you should see on your screen. We've just got four questions there. And if you don't see the poll, you can actually click on uh, the polling feature in your or on your admin panel there, it should launch it. Uh, the first question is, where are you located? Just to give you a sense of who's here. Um, we're in the Upper Key of Phoenix, which covers the whole western swath of the country there, and um, and then also into um, Hawaii and, and um, Alaska. Um, but uh, there are many different Upper Keys, many different jurisdictions represented, and so um, and different and different territories. So we want to find out where you are, what's your religious affiliation. And have you listened to any of the Becoming Byzantine Christ or Pascha series, just to see who's here and why you're here? That's, a, that's the fourth question. Tell us why you're here. So we'll give you another uh, 30 seconds or so to respond to these questions here, and we'll share the poll results. So Father, it looks like you are seated on a very high uh, a hill there uh, overlooking your church but that's 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 probably not the case right it's like i'm not here behind this uh, this beautiful pantocrator icon that you that's kind of shaded here right but that yeah, but this is the bird's eye it. view of the central dome of holy angels church here in san diego mm -hmm. overlooking mission valley in san diego beautiful and i was able to take this photograph with a drone that i happen to have and got a beautiful um picture and i i use this in uh our banners for our facebook and youtube feeds Terrific. and other other things so it's just a gorgeous uh view of our of our dome which was just recently well in the last three years it was the building of the domes was completed in 2020 right in the middle of the pandemic so 
Yeah, oh, it's it's very beautiful, and I've I've been to your parish a couple different times, and it's uh it's an amazing uh, community, and also the, the iconography, floor to ceiling, is just uh it's mm -hmm. just it's just beautiful. And our iconographer Mila Mina is still alive. She's ninety. She's in her nineties, I think ninety four, ah. and still comes to church. And uh, um, we're blessed to still have her with us. In fact, Father Deacon Jonathan, my my deacon, uh, had a. She, he and his wife, Pani Susan, just had a child last year, mm -hmm. and they named her after Mila. So. Oh, beautiful. That's yes. great. Well, and, and we, uh, the lower register of the icons and our iconostasis were, uh, were also written by her. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have that connection uh, in, the, uh, in our parish as well. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the polling and share the results. All right. Can everyone see the results there? All right, so let's see, uh, where are you located? Well, it looks like, Father, we've got uh, no one from the Northeast, but we've got a few in the Southwest, a um, few in the, a uh, little bit more in the West, some in the Southeast and the Midwest. So we're kind of covering mostly the, the Western half, uh, although we do get into the Southeast part of the country. Um, what is your religious affiliation? Um, the majority coming from Ruthenian Byzantine Catholic, uh, we have a couple in the Latin Catholic Church as well. And have you uh, listened to any of the Becoming Byzantine Christ or Pascha series? So a uh, little bit more than half appear to have, have done that, which is great. So hopefully, you know, if you haven't had a chance to listen to it and you're just coming in for the first time, you know, this is maybe a chance for you to, uh, to start to use that resource. And once we get our becomingbyzantine.net website up, you're going to have a lot of different learning tools and resources as well. Uh, that will that will be helpful. Um, and I'm here to learn more about my Byzantine Catholic faith. Looks like a little bit over half and explore a bit more about Eastern Catholicism in the Byzantine tradition. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you uh, for responding to the polls. And uh, let's see. Move my poll here. There we go. <clears throat> So again, uh, this is, uh, you know, part of the reason we're doing this is both for enrichment of Byzantine Catholics who want to learn more about the tradition, as well as those that may not come from our tradition and uh, who want to want to explore this. So with that said, let's let's dive into uh, our session here. Uh, let's see. I'm just checking my show notes here, Father. Um, so Father, let me ask you a quick question here. So we refer to this as the as Byzantine, Byzantine Christian formation for adults and use this title becoming Byzantine. What does that phrase mean to you, becoming Byzantine? And, and you know, what, what does it mean to be Byzantine? How much time do we have? Oh. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> For me, be becoming Byzantine uh, was a transformation of the way in which I viewed um, liturgy, the way in which I viewed church in general, having come from the Roman tradition, encountering the Byzantine East was a bit of a shock, even though I had some encounters when I was young, but there was a very different attitude towards liturgy. I don't want to, please don't take anything I say as disparaging the West, but just in, in just comparing the East and the West um, in terms of the whole ethos of, of, of liturgical expression with the everybody singing, no, no uh, musical instruments, full participation, which was a goal of Vatican II. They, you know, they talked about more full uh, participation by the laity, and I encountered that very much in the Byzantine East. Mm. Um, there's a different outlook towards um, many aspects of the faith. Mm. Uh, I don't want to say contradictory, but I prefer to say complementary with the West. Um, I often describe the uh, the faith as being a jewel, um, a great jewel that passes through the light of Christ to the world, and each church is a facet in that jewel. So that you may you will see the the faith expressed differently. Mm -hmm. And I just find for me, I came to the East and decided to make my home here because I felt more nourished for my own spiritual life with regards to um, the liturgy, primarily the liturgical life of the church. 
-hmm. And one of the reasons I'm a priest is that's one of that's the reason I am a priest is to celebrate the liturgy, um, first and foremost. Sure. Wonderful, Father. Yes, and you know, and and it's for a lot of people who grow up uh, in the in the Western tradition, it's it's one of those things that they're they they think when it comes to being Catholic, it just means the Western expression of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that is oftentimes shocking for people is that obviously it's not just the West, there's also the East, but it's not just the East singular, it's the Easts. Uh, there, there's so many other uh, ways of celebrating and living and believing in, as part of the, the whole Catholic communion of churches. Uh, the majority of churches that make up the one holy Catholic and apostolic church are actually Eastern churches. But the largest mm -hmm. of the churches in in our communion is the Latin West. There is the Latin Catholic Church. So for many people to discover that there is an East and then to discover that there are Easts is a um, is something that expands their view and definition, I think, of what Catholicity is. Mm -hmm. Yes. And 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 again, that's part of what we're trying to do. So let's just say up front that when we think about Eastern Catholicism or Eastern Catholicisms, we're not in any way attempting to say that the Byzantine uh, tradition is the only Eastern tradition or that it's the most important uh, Eastern tradition. In fact, in the United States, it's interesting, the Chaldean uh, Catholics have actually surpassed numerically the number of Byzantine Catholics, whether it's you know Greek Catholic or Byzantine Catholic, uh, those numbers in the United States uh, over the past several years. So there are more non-Byzantine Eastern Catholics now in the United States than there were 10 years ago. Um, so we have a we have this vast array of different expressions of our tradition, but it's it's wonderful to, at least to dive deep into our own if we're Byzantine or to get exposure to it if we're not. So Father, we're going to be using this Catechism Christ our Pascha, and uh, which which uh, your former classmate uh, Patriarch Sviatoslav had a had hand in your former uh, classmate, Father Michael Wynn, had a hand in helping to ensure the English language translation uh, was published. Um, can you say a little bit more about the, the catechism and its purpose? Uh, why, you know, why have a catechism? Um, and, and what are some of the ways that we can incorporate the catechism into our study and, and development in our faith? Well, much like the catechism of the Catholic Church that's for the primarily for the Roman tradition, although there are a lot of uh, aspects of the of the catechism of the Catholic Church that um, dives into the Eastern uh, mm -hmm. churches and the patristic texts. The catechism of or Christ our Pascha was done for by the Ukrainian patriarch to enrich the, the life of his church and all Byzantine churches. He, he tried to make sure that it was not just just about the Ukrainian church, but mm -hmm. it, it's useful for mm -hmm. any of the Byzantine traditions um, of the Catholic Church. And I hear that even some Orthodox churches have used it in, in some way in their own catechetical programs. Mm -hmm. The catechism is something that teaches the faith. Um, and the, uh, the Christ our Pasch is not is meant not just for initiates into the church, but for us all to enrich our understanding of the faith, liturgy, praxis. Um, and uh, so it's it's organized in such a way that is very palatable. It's very easy to hone in on a specific subject and get some really meaty uh, information. Um, it's seg segmented in small paragraphs. And I find that very useful as a, as a pastor who wants to um, share the richness of Christ our Pascha with the parishioners to be able to find little snippets that go into the bulletin or into emails and things like that. So I'm constantly using that to enrich our catechetical material online through the bulletins and, and such. So it's meant to be um, able to be, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Um, eaten in small chunks <laughs> so right, you, right. you know it's it's small um accessible approachable uh items uh in order and but then if you want to dive deeper of course it's 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 hundreds of pages long 
and right. well organized and easily you can easily find whatever specific topic that you're looking for. Yeah, in many ways, it it, it really is it, it weaves together the biblical, liturgical, patristic, magisterial, conciliar uh, traditions of the church, and even iconographical traditions of the church with the beautiful images that are in the catechism. I and I think it it gives us. Um, a way of drawing on many different sources and mm -hmm. resources to inspire our faith. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to the catechism, uh, Christ or Pascha, and then I've opened up and found a patristic quote that um, I had not seen before. And it gave me an insight. You know, we, we try to understand the church fathers or at least read the church fathers uh, and uh, to hear that witness of the Holy Spirit speaking through them, these many of whom were either taught directly by the apostles or taught by those who were taught by the apostles and, and so forth. We have this great witness in our tradition mm -hmm. of, of the church fathers, and the, the catechism is replete with uh, quote, quotes uh, from them. So, you know, it's a, it's a way of, you know, taking time, kind of meditating on on uh, on God's revelation to us, his invitation to us to communion, and then using some of the great witnesses of the church's life and tradition to uh, to inform that. So it's it's a great way to be informed. I would I would I would definitely agree. Yeah, and look at the footnotes. Look at the bibliography yeah. if you want to dive deeper. You exactly. can do as little or as much as you want with this. So yeah, it's 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 uh, it's. It's shallow enough for an uh, for a, a mouse to uh, to wade, and deep enough for an elephant to swim, as they say. Yes. Yeah. Well, and I want to I want to go ahead and launch another poll here, uh, which is a, a very short poll, which is you know regarding Christ or Pascha Catechism. Do you own a copy? Do you use the online version, or are you planning to buy one? Got some answers coming in here. Can you answer more? Can you answer more? I have both the online and the. So. <laughs> I guess right now we're just only just one. one. Okay. Just one answer. Yes. No. And I and I have two copies of the Catechism, so I could say I have three. I, <laughs> <thank> you. <laughs> yeah. There's there's one that I have that's uh, got all this. I because I use this to teach a, a, a Christian dogmatics class at the seminary. So it's mm -hmm. all got all the notes and the tabs and things like that. And I've got another one that's pristine that I'm just going to kind of keep and um, and make use of it when I when I need to. So I'm I also have a Ukrainian version of it, which was useful in my previous parish. Oh, so. oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And do we know how many languages it's in right now? I don't know. I would imagine probably Spanish. Yeah. Since there's a large Ukrainian contingent in uh, South America. Right. Um, and port and I would imagine Brazilian Portuguese as well. Probably a yes. large number of Ukrainians there. So it looks like we've got <coughs> almost half that own a copy, uh, a couple that are using the online version, and some that are planning to buy one. So we're going to post a link here in just a little bit to give you access to the um, uh, to to the place where you can purchase this. But I do want to post a link to the RoyalDoors.net site. This is Father Michael Wynn's. Uh, primarily his uh, his effort, and he there's a page there uh, on the Catechism, Christ or Pascha, great resources. There's also, if you look to the right on that page, you can download the PDF version of the Catechism and, and make use of it. If you want to print it out, it's pretty sizable, but um, it might be easier just to buy one. And the link I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post here in just a little bit is to the Eparchy of St. Josephat's page where you can buy copies of Christ or Pascha. That's one of the places that you can get them. At one point, I think, Father, they were, they had run out of copies. They had done their run and, and now thankfully we're, we're back, uh, they, they're back in full stock. So mm -hmm. I'd also like to point out on the website, um, there is a, a liturgical texts and music link, especially for those of the Ukrainian uh, church that gives you um, access to Vespers texts, divine liturgy texts for throughout the year. Very, very useful for those of you who would like to um, have access to those texts that are put together from multiple sources. So the, all the work is done for you with those texts. And it's it can sometimes be very daunting if you're trying to learn the services. If you're a cantor or just want to know what all the different parts of the liturgy are for a specific feast day. So 
Thank you. That's that. very, very true. And I think he also publishes homily, uh, homily notes uh, from yes. time to time as well. So, all right. Well, so let's dive into the lessons here. Uh, and, uh, you know, we think about the, the Catechism and the Christ or Pascha series and, and what we've attempted to do to sort of divide and conquer, uh, as, as Father alluded to, you can't eat the whole elephant. So we've been using a lot of elephants here in reference to swimming and then now to eating the whole elephant. But you won't be able to eat the whole thing, digest the whole catechism, but you can break it up into its parts. And so there, there we, we started in the lessons uh, for the first section um, when Father Joseph Matlack was uh, recording his, his teachings. Uh, we've got some summaries here of that. So, Father, would you like to walk us through this first lesson and uh, that's provided in the Christ or Pascha series? Sure. Um, well, we see here that the topics include the Byzantine Catechumenate, uh, faith, life, and worship, and our proclamation, um, which is so important for the Catechumenate to learn what the church's proclamation of the truth is to the world, because that's what the Catechumenate is about. And um, I'd like to give you a little quote from the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church's um, catechetical directory in, in addition to this, but um, the, the Nicene Creed is what we encounter, which gives us the content of the Christian faith. It's a creed that's shared by um, most of the Western churches and the Eastern churches. And it's an important part of the enrollment of a catechumen. He, he or she recites that, or the sponsors of a, of a catechumen recite that as a um, statement of faith. We call it the symbol of faith. And as Father um, Dozier mentions here, we call the creed a symbol because it impresses upon the soul of the believer like a wax mold, the basic and life-giving essential teachings of Jesus Christ. I'd also like to um, expand that understanding of the word symbol. Uh, symbolon in Greek can also mean uh, something that unites. And for the Western mind these days thinks of a symbol as something that is standing in place of something that's hidden or, or whatever, but it, the, the authentic understanding of symbolon is something that unites the hidden with the seen, and it reveals a deeper meaning. So um, the symbol of faith unites these very different, not different, but these separate aspects of the Christian faith, one dealing with the Father, one dealing with the Son, and one dealing with the Holy Spirit, and the final fourth paragraph dealing with the church. So it unites all of those, revealing to the world something that um, is maybe not evident, but it, it, it unites those things. And I use the word unite because the opposite of the, uh, I'm sorry, of symbolon is diabolon, which is to divide. And that's where the origin of the word diabolical comes from. So I, I just wanted to um, emphasize that the symbol of faith brings together the various aspects of the, of the Christian proclamation of the world in this very clear statement of our our um belief and as the third section says here the creed is resurrection centered because the resurrection the resurrection of christ holds a central place in the christian faith and paul says if the resurrection isn't true our faith is dead it's useless so of course the the uh, proclamation of our faith in the creed would ultimately or essentially be resurrectional And the worship, there's a there's a Latin phrase, uh, um, lex orandi, lex credendi est, the law of faith is the law of belief. I'm sorry, the law of... Um, um, law of uh, prayer, worship? The prayer, yeah, the, the, uh, the prayer of the church expresses the belief of the church. Mm -hmm. The law of prayer is the law of faith, um, or, or of belief, I should say. So... Our worship informs and celebrates what we believe. So everything that we believe is expressed in our liturgical aspects. And this is so um, evident in the Eastern Catholic tradition, especially in the anaphora that we uh, use in our church. We have two and sometimes a third anaphora used in the Byzantine tradition. 
the anaphora of St. Basil, which is used during the Great Fast, uh, is older than Chrysostom's. And if you are unfamiliar with it, I encourage you to find a copy of it and just read the anaphora, which means uh, the prayer of thanksgiving. Um, I believe the Roman Church uh, re refers to that central part of the Divine Liturgy as the canon, mm -hmm. um, which expresses such rich theological uh, truths about salvation history. Mm -hmm. And so we have the anaphora of St. Basil, which is used during the Great Fast, as well as um, several other times during the year, the Feast of St. Basil, uh, Eve of Christmas, Eve of Theophany. Um, and then we have the anaphora of St. John Chrysostom, which is used most of the rest of the year. And once, maybe twice a year, we might you, you might encounter in the Byzantine tradition, the anaphora of St. James, especially on the Feast of St. James. And we in, at Holy Angels have a Melkite community that uh, uses our church, and they are St. Jacob's, which is um, St. James. And so on the Feast of St. James, they will have the liturgy of St. James, um, which is very beautiful. But very, you know, there's a lot of difference, um, similarity, but difference in terms of the way in which the, the divine liturgy is celebrated. And we were mentioning the catechumen. Um, and I said I was going to to make a quote of uh, or refer to a quote from the uh, catechetical directory of the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Um, it says the catechumen experienced communion with Christ, not only through the word of God, but also through the liturgical cycle by praying and entering into the principal events of the life of the Savior in the holy days of the church year. The catechumen, it used to it consist of three years. Uh, I don't think, uh, we don't do it that way these, these days, but some, some people actually do extend their catechumen it out. So it says the three-year catechumen period corresponded to the three years of Christ's public ministry. During this time, the catechumens gradually came to make a mature decision to follow Christ further or to leave. Thanks to the catechumenate practice, the Church of Christ was able to successfully avoid religious superficiality as well as formalistic performance of church practice. So that points to the importance of the catechumenate in order to lead the catechumen to a mature decision in the process of, of uh, like it says, to either accept it or to leave um, before being baptized. Uh, and so it says, for you catechumens are not about to be led into an empty dignity, but to the actual kingdom, and not simply to a kingdom, but to the kingdom of heaven itself. So that points or shows us how important the catechumenate is, and I'm, I'm happy to say that the catechumenate is, is being restored in many places into its proper practice. In fact, I was blessed to bless a catechumen for Holy Angels on Pentecost Sunday, Wonderful. as well as chrismating a whole family of young children as well. So on Pentecost of all days, which was a beautiful uh, example to the community as a whole yes. of the uh, reality of the action of Christ in the world. So. That's wonderful, Father. Yeah, I, I, we have uh, a couple of catechumens at uh, St. Irene's right now uh in portland and it's uh it's it's wonderful to be able to pray those litanies of the catechu for the catechumens mm -hmm. and, uh in the in the liturgy you know for those praying for those who are actually preparing uh to enter the kingdom uh like mm -hmm. Christ says so that's 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 wonderful okay well i already talked about symbol on yeah um so there's several different meanings for symbol on the, the seal as the, you know, the wax uh, seal, the mm -hmm. signet ring Remember, you know, you've seen, um, I think in some movies showing the, you know, uh, medieval practice or even more ancient practice where the person in charge, perhaps the emperor or a king or a, um, a judge would complete the act of a declaration of some importance with a seal and then he would hit the or he would stamp that that wax that hot wax with his signet ring leaving an impression of the emperor or whatever the signet ring signified but that was kind of the seal 
uh, on that declaration. In fact, we kind of have a little bit of an indication of that at the at the mystery of uh, chrismation when the uh, uh, person who's being chrismated is anointed with the holy miron, um, the holy chrism, um, and he says the priest says the seal of the Holy Spirit. And in some places, as in as at holy angels, when the priest says the seal of the Holy Spirit, the community um, acclaims at the same time seal, giving their approval to this act of sealing this person with the holy chrism. Thereby, like it's like the signet ring, stamping them with the, with the um, symbol, with the image of the Holy Spirit. And we mentioned also the anaphora, the different anaphoras that we use at the central Eucharistic prayer, which is a prayer of thanksgiving and consecration. Um, and just, uh, just a little point, there are some Eastern, I, well, one Eastern anaphora that I know about, that uh, the anaphora of Mar Adai, which was used, is used in the Assyrian Church of the East that has no consecration in it. There are no words of institution, and yet the church has always recognized that as a commemoration of a prayer of thanksgiving in which the body and blood of our Lord is made presence present in the bread and the wine um so for us as as we said earlier the we use the anaphora of john chrysostom basil and sometimes saint james and we've already touched on the the meaning of catechism a, pop, a popular summary of comp compendium of catholic doctrine and faith and morals designed for use in catechetics okay this is important the creed is more than just a laundry list it's a lived extension of salvation history that we experience through prayer, especially through worship. And you should think about that the next time you go to church. Listen to the creed as it's sung and identify that I would say identify the four parts, the one about the Father, the one about the Son, the one about the Holy Spirit, and then finally wrapping it all up with what the church is and um and leading to the eschat eschatological under eschatological under uh, understanding of the second coming of christ and the realization of the church in his uh, the body of christ in the eschaton and salvation history is a story which of which we are an essential part that's really really important history we often think of as something in the past well salvation history is something from the past something of the present and something of the future which we are all important parts of and incorporated into and um, hopefully living out that salvation history in whatever we do in our lives. Yes, absolutely, Father. It's, it's amazing, too, how the, the use of the anaphora of St. Basil the Great to structure the presentation of the faith in the catechism in many respects uh, gives it its proper orientation to worship, but it also lays out the history of salvation in a, in a very beautiful way that's and how it's tied into our worship as as a church and, mm -hmm. and you know we we understand that you know it's not just that we're worshiping an idea of god we're, we're worshiping a god who involved himself in human history from the from the moment of creation uh to uh kind of the 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 progression of salvation history with israel or you know and the and the patriarchs and israel and then finally the coming of christ and now the church this is a this is a god who involves himself in history and and mm -hmm. like you're saying we're part of that history now which is which is terrific even today i was used uh in the homily for today for the feast of the call of the first apostles i reminded my people that jesus christ is a is a man a god who came became man lived among us and got his hands dirty yes literally <laughs> in or um in order to bring about our salvation um, so it's a very active God that we have, not this, you know, pie in the sky type of uh, understanding of God, but a really, really present man who right. um, brings us along. So. Yeah, exactly. And so that's, you know, that's part of the, the the personalism, I think, that's also in our faith that, you know, he's called us, you know, mm -hmm. humanity generally, but each of us, you know, somehow or another are, are called by God uh, directly. I've, I've often thought about that in the use of the way we celebrate the sacramental mysteries and in, in the fact that we use the names of the individuals 
who are who are receiving the mysteries not just you know at uh you know at the wedding you know where mm -hmm. you've got the the couple you're, you're just like these are individuals who are coming forward to receive these are human persons coming forward to receive this mystery in the heart of the church and god is calling you by name so mm -hmm. it's uh it's a profound experience for for many people so it thank really you, is oh, sorry go ahead. yeah i i think that aspect of being called by name is so important because names are essential or very important and when our Lord wanted to emphasize something that is some role or vocation of certain people in the Old Testament and the New Testament, what did he do? He changed their names. Yes. Sarah, Sarai became Sarah. Abram became Abraham. Peter, or I'm sorry, Simon became Peter. Right. And um, so in a certain sense, they were named by, by God to inform them and the whole world of their vocation. Yes, Absolutely. Well, that's great, Father. Well, thank you. That's, uh, I think, a great summary of the of the first lesson. Uh, and uh, again, if you haven't had a chance to go in and listen to Father Joseph Matlack and his wonderful teachings um, for these first three lessons, we're providing something of a summary here of these and uh, as a way of orientation. But if you if it's uh, if you've listened to it already, then this should be a, also a refresher for you as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm going to then dive into the second lesson. Where the topic is is going to take another look at the symbol of Nicaea, the Ni Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, which is the creed that we all profess uh, in the liturgy. Um, one of the things that's important to think about here is that the resurrection of Christ is our point of de departure on the journey of faith. It is in this faith that the church was established and grew in the early centuries of the church. So as Father James mentioned before, kind of qu quoting uh, St. Paul, you know, if Christ is not risen from the dead, then our faith is in vain. Certainly, the resurrection of Christ is, is absolutely essential and critical uh, because it opens up for us an understanding of why did God get involved in history in the first place? When, when the God the Father sent his son to uh, take flesh, you know, we, we believe in the catechism affirms this, that this was always God's plan, his divine plan from the, before the beginning of creation. Uh, he predestined his son to take flesh in the Virgin Mary to become one of us. Uh, but that was going to take some time uh, over time to prepare the way for the son. And certainly after the fall, you know, mercy triumphs over even our sin. Uh, and God still continues to fulfill that that great desire. But he has to overcome the power of sin and death. And this is what the resurrection is about. It's about God coming as Emmanuel, coming in our midst, uh, leading us back to the Father. But how does he have to do it? First, he has to remove any impediment, anything that keeps us both as creatures and as, as fallen human beings that keeps us uh, bound to death, bound to the kingdom of darkness. And so the resurrection is that moment where we pivot, uh, where we turn. It's like a nexus, you know, God condescends, but then it turns at the cross and we begin a path of ascent back to the Father. And in that path of ascent, it begins at the cross, but then goes into the tomb. And then as Jesus rises from the dead and then ascends to the right hand of the Father, he sends the Spirit so that we might then uh, join in the resurrection of Christ in that full ascension back to the Father, the, the unoriginate source of all life, both uh, uncreated and created life. So Jesus it rises from the dead to bring us with him back to the Father. And so the resurrection is a, is a pivotal mystery for us. And it's why every Sunday is a feast of resurrection for us, a mini, a mini resurrection and a renewal also of our baptism. And so the creed, which emerged out of the whole process of initiation, uh, where an individual would profess faith in the Father, and then the Son, and then the Holy Spirit, and as they go through a triple immersion in the faith, the creed became a statement of faith, but it was also the faith that was being indelibly marked on the soul, that uh, this person now was, had, had moved, had been transferred from the kingdom of darkness, had now turned in this metanoia now towards the kingdom of light, and we see that physically in the process of, of initiation, where they turn from the west, and then they turn to the east, to Christ, uh, the light. And this is a whole new orientation of our, our existence now towards life, towards light, towards the kingdom of God and away from the kingdom of darkness. Uh, 
And so the creed it becomes that full flowering of that faith rooted in the resurrection of Christ, that key turning moment away from darkness to light. Uh, so the resurrection then, the central mystery of our faith, demonstrates Christ's victory over death. He conquers death in all its forms, its preternatural form and, and with, the, with the devil, its uh, uh, moral form or spiritual form in terms of sin itself, <laughs> and, then, and then physical death. All forms of death are conquered by Christ. And if you've ever heard the Paschal homily of St. John Chrysostom, this marvelous exposition of the joy that should be filling our hearts, uh, not just on Pascha, but every Sunday that is Pascha, uh, where, you know, where, um, you know, death grabbed uh, humanity and grabbed earth and it found divinity, you know, that, that whole thing, forgiveness has risen from the grave, you know, all these beautiful images that we see that really reflect the joy of being delivered from bondage uh, from our former slavery, much like the Israelites being delivered from bondage and slavery to Pharaoh, we have been delivered from bondage and slavery to sin, death, and the devil. And uh, we now make our passage through the waters of holy baptism. And uh, there at the mountain of God, receive the law of God written on our hearts through the Holy Spirit in chrismation, that seal of the Holy Spirit. And God feeds us on that, uh, that, that bread of life, the living manna, uh, as we sojourn towards the promised land of heaven. This is, this is that transformation that's taking place. And this is Christ allows us to participate in that exodus with him uh, as, our, as our true Passover. And, but the creed itself, it, it really was developed. Of course, it was developed out of the baptismal tradition, two ecumenical councils, Nicaea, which was focused especially on the teaching of who is Jesus Christ. Uh, was he the eternal son of God? Was he a demiurge? Was the, um, the Arian teaching or, or some sort of, you know, like God, but not quite God? <coughs> Excuse me. And once that was clarified by Nicaea that, yes, he was fully God, um, as well as being fully man, uh, Constantinople also clarified the, the, the divinity of the full divinity of the person of the Holy Spirit. So this Trinitarian profession of faith that we have that is reflected in our baptism that is, by the way, renewed when we make the sign of the cross. We make the sign of the cross. We have the three fingers signifying the three persons of the Holy Trinity, the two fingers signifying the two natures of Christ. We make the sign of the cross as a renewal of our baptism. Originally, by the way, you make the sign of the cross, you just kind of do your forehead. And then it started expanding from there because this was where you were anointed first. Uh, and, uh, and so it was a renewal of your baptism. Then it, it turned into the upper torso. And then it was the whole body. Uh, you see some people uh, will do, will, you know, make the sign of the cross and go down to the floor. You know, it's, it's the idea of I am signed with Christ. I am, I am, I am uh, now conformed cruciformally with Christ. And I've entered into his victory over sin and death by being signed now as, as in the image of that self-giving love that he poured out upon the cross. Uh, and, so, and so the creed itself is rooted in this affirmation of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, uh, that we mark ourselves with uh, in addition to the cross of Christ, because it's on the cross that the Trinity is revealed, as well as Christ uh, in his love for mankind. You know, the the, uh, the, the opening of his side and blood and water coming out was also an image of, of uh, Trinitarian love being poured out upon the world. The son imaging the father and out of the side of the father comes forth uh, blood signifying the son and uh, the incarnate son and water signifying the spirit. So Trinitarian life is imaged in the cross. So when we sign ourselves with the cross, we're professing faith not only in uh, Jesus Christ, and his offering of his life for us, but also his uh, the, the Holy Trinity uh, that we that we profess a faith in. And then the creed then is a prayerful summary of the life of the church. This is what defines, you know, when the bishop comes to visit a parish and he blesses the vineyard of the Lord, which is where we get our title from, the, you know, this, this ministry, Vineyard of the Lord Catholic Ministries, he has two candles, two candlesticks. One is called Trichiri or Trichirion, and the other is called Dicurion. Or in the shorthand is tricky and dicky, but we won't, we won't say the trickerion, dickerion, trickerion, the three candles, dickerion, the two candles. These are the two central mysteries of our Christian faith. This is what makes us different from every other 
uh, religious expression, if you will, in the world, that we believe in not just God generically, but God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in Jesus Christ, true God and true man. And so this profession of faith uh, that we see summarized in the creed uh, is, uh, is, is, is incorporated into our prayer as a church, because the, in that moment, we are renewing our baptismal faith as we begin to approach the, uh, the, to receive the very body and blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, we renew our baptism, and then we also renew our baptism in the prayer of the um, of preparation for Holy Communion, where we profess faith in Christ as well as in uh, the body and blood of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. So the key terms that we've talked about, you know, this idea of the church is very important, obviously. Uh, you know, the church was not some ancillary part of God's plan. It's God's like, oh, I'm sending down Jesus Christ. He's going to come and he's going to redeem you all. And I'm just going to, you're all going to be a bunch of loosely affiliated disciples running around the world and uh, spreading the good news with your King James Version Bibles and the church it'll just sort of evolve. No, the church was at the heart of the plan because what was the church? The church was the kingdom of God. The church was the mystical body of the new Adam. It was the temple of the Holy Spirit. It was, it was a new Israel of God. And so this assembly, this in the Hebrew, Kahal Yahweh, the, 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 the ingathering of the nations and the Jews together in, in a covenant family of God, this assembly was God's plan. He needed to uh, not only form a people, but he wanted to form a people that made up a new humanity, uh, a new race. Sometimes the fathers say it's a new race. The Christian race is a new race uh, that God has established among the nations. So the church is at the heart of God's plan of salvation. And Pascha is the mystery that we are there announcing. You know, um, th th it's our Passover. Uh, referring especially to the resurrection of Christ, more generally to the events of the Paschal Mystery. And I would even add to this list of the Paschal Mystery, I think the Incarnation is part of the Paschal Mystery, death, resurrection, ascension of Christ, and its consummation at his return. When, when Father uh, James and I pray the Anaphora, you know, there's a point where we talk about all these mysteries being commemorated in the celebration of the Eucharist. It's not just, not just the crucifixion. Uh, it's not just his passion. But, uh, but, but also his resurrection, his ascension, his return in glory. All these mysteries are commemorated in, uh, and celebrated in the, in the Anaphora, in the prayer of the offering. And then finally, Nicaea, Constantinople. Again, I mentioned these, uh, these two councils being important. And the conciliar tradition, really, more broadly, is extremely important to the Byzantine church. You know, we, we honor, commemorate the first seven ecumenical councils. Um, and, and the reason we do is because they exercise a primacy within the whole conciliar tradition. So there are many different other local councils uh, in the Catholic communion. There are 21 ecumenical councils, but these first seven are so, uh, they have a primacy in part because they define so many of the essential parts of the doctrines that we believe, but also uh, because they represent the coming together of, of East and West in Catholic communion um, and so Nicaea and Constantinople really represent those first steps within the, the seven steps of the seven, seven ecumenical councils. The, the, the last of them affirming uh, the teaching on icons, the holy icons, which we'll get into uh, as we get into our, our teaching on the faith. So we've delved in a little bit of the history uh, of, of the, the, um, in this lesson. You know, we, we, we want to be thankful for the history that we have. So we always want to reflect on, do we have something to be thankful for being part of a, of a, a body of believers, a church that has a history, that's steeped in history. And then we've also seen that the creed is, is a prayerful, <laughs> excuse me, contemplation of the church. We hope you uh, take some time to really read through uh, the creed as well. So Father, when turning it over to you for the last part and lesson three, uh, if you want to do a quick summary of that, and then we'll we'll wrap up for our evening. Well, we quickly mentioned the anaphora of St. Basil. Um, it's, a, as I said earlier, it's a much, er, well, it's an older anaphora than St. Chrys John Chrysostom's. Mm -hmm. It's <laughs> incredibly rich. Um, and through the anaphora of Basil, 
we see this very, very explicit unfolding of the events of our salvation. This whole salvation history is, is, un, or is revealed to us. And I want to emphasize that it's not, I, well, I emphasized earlier that the history is past, present, and future. And Father uh, Daniel mentioned that, that we, part of the anaphora says, we remember the second coming which is odd if you really start thinking about it, but if you are in the mind of the church and the mind of Christ, the ever-present now, um, all of this is revealed and unfolded within the anaphora of St. Basil. And I kind of wish that we had the anaphora all year round. <laughs> it is such a rich and um, catechetical anaphora as well. Um, and one point I wanted to emphasize is that we, through the praying of the anaphora, aren't just simply recounting history, but we're living it. We are present um, at the cross. We are present at the incarnation. We are present at all of these aspects that are that are um, revealed and um, unfolded uh, in terms of the liturgical life of the church. It's I often described it almost as if we are in a time machine. We may not be aware with our eyes that we are at the foot of the cross or we are at the manger in Bethlehem or we are listening to G or watching Jesus call the first disciples as, to as today was the gospel. But through the liturgy, we actually are there. We are present with our Lord. We are present with the saints. We are present at the foot of the cross. And through the liturgy, we then experience these truths of the faith as a communion, as um, I um, can't emphasize that en enough. We are not in this alone, but we are saved together. Salvation is the body of Christ. And if we are members of the body of Christ, that means that that person standing next to us in the church is part of that same prayer part of the same liturgy, part of the body that we are a body, part of the body of, and so we are saved together. We're not saved individually. And through the anaphora, in the anaphora prayer, the prayer of thanksgiving, we, um, we really take part. We are present and we participate in all of that that we hear about the salvific acts of Christ. Um, and if we we're only to begin to understand the reality of what we we were participating in. I don't know if we could actually bear it. Um, so that's how important these um, liturgical acts are because it makes present again in our lives. It's a, we have to be careful when we say the word representation. No, it's a re-presentation. Mm -hmm. We have to put the, ac the accent on the right syllable. It's a representation in our lives of the reality of Christ's sacrifice, Christ's incarnation, Christ's ascension, the descent of the Holy Spirit. All of that is encapsulated and made present again in our in our lives. Mm -hmm. So let's yeah. So let's. Um, there's a few essential terms that we need to remind ourselves of. Liturgy. Liturgy comes from the Greek term liturgios, which means the work of the people. So it's not, we aren't um, um, part, uh, spectators, but we are participants. Mm -hmm. um, it's important that we stand together, we pray together, we sing together, because we're not there to be entertained, but we're there to act. And the epistle today uh, for this Sunday reminded us the importance of doing, not just hearing. Mm -hmm. um, and so the liturgy, it's, it is literally work. It's something for us to do, and not just a nice thing, but we are commanded to do it. Passover comes from the uh, the ancient. Um, well, Passover reminds us of the freedom of the Egypt of the uh, Hebrew people from slavery in Egypt, and how the angel of death passed over those that had shown that they were members of the the, the Hebrew nation through the paint uh, through the putting of the, the door uh, uh, on the door jams the blood of the lamb. And because of that, we refer to 
Christ's death as the fulfillment of the ancient Pesach, the ancient Passover. Mm -hmm. And that's where we get our word Pascha. Um, and so that ancient event foreshadows Christ's delivering us from eternal slavery to sin and death through his blood, the blood of the, of the true lamb, um, and delivering us from that slavery, not to Egypt, but to sin. And again, Basil and Chrysostom, both fathers of the church, particularly influential in our Byzantine tradition because of their preaching and their Eucharistic prayers. And we see that Basil lived from 330 to 379. That doesn't seem just 49 years. Awfully young to be accomplishing what he did. It puts me to shame. <laughs> and Chrysostom from 347 to 407 AD. We owe an awful lot to these men and all of the uh, fathers of the church and mothers of the church in their establishing for us the rule of faith, uh, revealing to us the, um, the essentials of the faith, both in the councils and through the patristic writings of such as Chrysostom and Basil. Mm -hmm. so we have such a rich faith um, centered on the work of these men and women. Um, we are told again and again in our culture that prayer is a private affair. I mentioned that earlier. It's, we are in it together. We have to uh, remember the communal uh, liturgical aspect of prayer. And I emphasize this, or I want to also mention, not emphasize, but mention that the proper tradition is that if I'm alone in the church, I cannot celebrate the divine liturgy by myself. Mm -hmm. Unlike the Latin church, I, I, it used to be the case. I don't know if it still is, but... There, there used to be a very common practice of private liturgies, mm -hmm. um, but we can't do that in, in the Byzantine tradition because there's the need for the um, dialogue between priest and deacon, priest and uh, the community, especially with the amens that are pronounced at certain points in the divine liturgy, especially at the epiclesis, the calling down of the Holy Spirit. So it's essentially a communal act. Mm -hmm. And we will, um, we had a chance to just start to dive into the, to Basil's Anaphora, and I would encourage, um, do we have a link to an online version of the Anaphora of Basil? I think it's available on the MCI. It, it, um, it could be available on the MCI. Uh, yes, we could, we could look for that. Uh, it's, it's definitely in the catechism. Yes, uh, but uh, but yeah, we could we could certainly look for that and then send that out to everybody. We'll post that. We'll we'll post that on becomingbyzantine.net. Mm -hmm. uh, it's extremely so valuable to uh, uh, enriching to read that and to um, really take your time to chew on it a bit and to um, uh, take it into yourself and and meditate upon it. It's it's a wonderful. Every time I pray the Anaphora of Basil, I learn something new. Probably because I forgot it, but I still learn something new each time I pray it. It's a it's a blessing to to celebrate the liturgy in that way. I it used to be done I secretly. Mm -hmm. it used to, the, the anaphora of Basil and Chrysostom used to be done quietly while the choir would sing over the priest. But thank God that the church has changed that um, that way in which we do it so that the prayer is done out loud and the people right. can take it into themselves and really participate even more fully absolutely yeah. yeah i find the same thing too father it's a uh it's a it's an honor and a blessing to be able to pray the anaphora uh but you know as you as you mentioned it's not just the priest praying the prayers he's praying with and for the the, the all the faithful that are there and mm -hmm. so it's a it's important you know to to know what you're praying to to do what Saint Theophon the Recluse says, which is to to pray with with warmth and understanding, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that's uh, you know, people don't think about oh the priests, you know, we have our we have our piety too, we have our need to uh, to make this prayer our own, um, not to create anything new, but to create something new in us, you know, the the the, the grace of realizing uh, Christ, our High Priest, you know, as the as the celebrant there with the holy spirit it's a um and it's not just the 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 clergy it's the whole church mm -hmm. uh, together 
Uh, the yeah, there's very, very little of the divine liturgy, Basil or Chrysostom, that is meant only for the priest. Right. Very, very little. The rest of it is meant to be a common proclamation of, of the faith Absolutely. among everyone. Well, well, wonderful, Father, and uh, this is this has been terrific. I I, I very much appreciate uh, uh, your insights and and your thoughts here. Uh, also, appreciate everyone participating today. I I do want to make mention. I've posted a few things. I did post the link if you'd like to support the work that we're doing. Uh, there's a link to a Stripe account that you can make a donation. Uh, there's also uh, a link to um, the bookstore that the Byzantine Church supplies. Evidently, the Epic of St. Joseph had has run out, so I spoke too soon by saying, by saying <laughs> they have copies. Uh, uh, they, so we're going to be looking for some more, but I did give you a, a supply here at, at Byzantine Church supplies. You can purchase it there. And I also want to post one other link to God with us online. So this is an apostolate of the Eastern uh, Catholic bishops in the United States, and we have a number of different live events that take place to help educate people on the Eastern Church's Eastern uh, Christian faith, Eastern Catholic faith, uh, and so you can also take advantage of the resources that are available through through God with us online. So, uh, Father, would you like to lead us in prayer as we conclude uh, this evening? Sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Most glorious ever virgin, blessed Theotokos, present our prayers to your son and our God and plead with him that through you he may save our souls. My hope is the Father, my refuge is the Son, my protection is the, is the Holy Spirit. Holy Trinity, glory to you. All my hope I place in you, O Mother of God, guard me under your protection. In you, O full of grace, all creation rejoices, the order of angels and the human race as well. O oh, sanctified temple, spiritual paradise, and glory of virgins, from whom our God, who exists before all eternity, took flesh and became a little child. He has taken your womb as his throne, making it more spacious than the heavens. Therefore, O oh, full of grace, in you all creation rejoices. Glory to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you all, and uh, be looking for communications on the website, uh, becomingbyzantine.net, as well as uh, other opportunities. We'll make sure we include you in that. And thank you for your time this evening, and uh, glory to Jesus Christ, glory forever. Glory forever. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father.